excited. I'm really excited. This is the last, um, this is the very last of our cop series, our Christians on Purpose. And the, the subject that we're going to talk about today, I think, is so needed. It's definitely needed. I want to make sure we get this one on tape and we ship this one across the world. I'm excited. I'm excited. You guys have been doing a wonderful job. Put your hands together with our Bible drive. You know, I was in a, that Bible drive has gone out all over. I was in Tennessee all this past week. And as soon as I got into town, as soon as I got into town, some of our friends came right up to me and said, Pastor, we got something for you. And they handed me a whole, a whole bag full of Bibles. So we're going to be able to get those Bibles out all over the world. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm excited about that. People are going to have a sword to fight with. And so I want you to encourage your friends and family. Make sure they're doing the same thing. Getting those Bibles, bringing those Bibles here. Even if they don't go to the love church, it has nothing to do with it. We want to make sure that we get those extra Bibles to send all over the world. All right, are y'all ready for the Word of God? I, I'm going to ask you that. Are y'all ready for the word? Yes. All right. Just check it. The Bible says we're going to turn to Romans t uh, 12. Mm. Romans 12. 5 through 10. That is our scriptures for today. Romans 12. 5 through 10. It says, so we, say we. We. He's talking about us. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and Every one members one of another. Have, uh, verse 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Verse 7 says, Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teaches on teaching. Verse 8 says, or he that exhorteth on ex exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that rule with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And verse 9 says, let, uh, let love, there's that word again, love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. And verse 10 says, be kindly be kindly, be kindly, affection one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Amen. We're talking this. We're talking today in our series of on cops being Christians on purpose, and this is this is a, a very appropriate subject. Is the body of Christ? If you're writing some notes down, I want you to write down the body. Of Christ, we hear a lot about the body of Christ. People say, you know, we need to uplift the body of Christ. And people hear that all the time. People who have been in church for 15 million years hear that a million times a day. But you know, if you haven't been in church, maybe you never heard of that term, the body of Christ. If, if, if this is the first church you've been to, maybe you have, you're not familiar with that term, the body of Christ. And it's something that we all need to be very familiar with. And to be honest with you, even if you've been in church for a very, very long time and you use that word a lot, sometimes you don't even know what it means. Sometimes you don't have a really good grasp for what that body of Christ means. So we're going to get deeper down and, and uh, explain what the body of Christ means. And staying with our subject of cops, being able to not only say Christians on purpose, but equating that to the people who are our fine police officers in the field, we're going to look at the police side. Of, of what we call the body of Christ. We're going to look at the police side. So I want you to think about something. Whenever we say the police, now that's pretty forceful, but a lot of times we, don't, we go a little bit further and we say the force. Y'all heard that word? The force, the police force. Those people who are, who are sent out to be able to do all the things that we really don't want to do. Right? We don't want to show up to a shooting, right? I don't. I'm not trying to run to a shooting. We don't want to show up when someone uh, uh, has domestic violence, okay? But when you hear the force, that sounds powerful. Force, the whole police force. They're coming in with a lot of might, a lot of power. You hear force. Now, when you think about the force, and when we think about the police, we really just say the police. We don't say the detective. We don't say uh, the guy who's responsible um, for putting the hubcaps 
on the car. We say the police. We say it all together, right? The police. As a matter of fact, whenever someone's doing you wrong and you've had a bad experience um, with the police force, maybe someone's pulled you over and they've talked to you inappropriately and they've said some things that they shouldn't, or maybe you've been arrested for not doing anything, and, and because of that, you will say, the police did me wrong, right? Sometimes we don't say that police officer, we don't say cop car 572 is doing some inappropriate, inappropriate things, we say the police, right? But I want you to think about what that really means. Now, in the police, uh, in, the, in, the, in the realm of police stuff, there's a lot of different jobs. It's not just one job, it's a lot of jobs. Matter of fact, there's a whole lot of jobs. Let's talk through a couple of, we, we have the one that we know, which is the, the, the patrol officer. We're familiar with the patrol officer, amen? amen. Yeah, we're very familiar with the patrol officer. It can be your greatest friend and your greatest enemy all at the same time. But he is the person that we usually identify with when we talk about the police, because that's the one that we see all the time. Now, if we go a little bit further, there's some other people that we, we may not see. Maybe the communication specialist. They have communication specialists on the police force. They also have people who are responsible for coming into a crime scene and being able to assess the crime scene. They have people who, who uh, uh, research and, and, and go beyond what happened that day, called detectives. They go and do detective work to find out all the things that happened with that particular crime scene. And you all you guys are all familiar with this because of the new TV show, CSI. Those are the scientists sometimes. They come and they, they, they assess the situation and they look at what we miss. As a matter of fact, I was watching something one time and they were able to catch a guy. And this, this, this would have went um, un, uh, unsolved. They were able to catch a guy because of the type of moss that was born in the area at that time. Now, they, they, the, the regular police officers, when they came and took a look at the, 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 the situation there and assessed that they couldn't find anyone that really matched the description or they couldn't find who probably did it. When the CSI people came on the scene, they looked beneath the obvious. They were further than the, than the average police officer. And in doing that, one of the things that they noticed is that there, were, uh, there was some moss on, left on the scene, probably from the vehicle. And the thing about the moss that was left on the scene, it was not the type of moss that should have been growing in that area. As a matter of fact, the type of moss that was left should have been growing in an area far, far away from it. And because of that moss, long story short, they were able to track down that individual that did it. They were able to find the moss on the car and be able to track it down. They have people who just sit in the office and they dispatch individuals. They don't serve on the front line, they just dispatch them. They send them out. You know what I'm talking about? So when the call comes in, we've got a call from so-and-so. We've got a call from uh, domestic violence. We've got a 187 call. We have an officer down call. And those people will send out the message. Send out a message. And when they send out that message, then the police officers who are on the scene respond to that. Are y'all with me? Amen. You have people that are specifically, believe it or not, dog trained. These are the people we don't really think about when we think about the police. We just think about the people who show up and, and handle and carry the big guns. But there are people who get paid in the world of the police force and train the same way who train dogs. They call it the canine unit. So all of these people are very important to running a police force. All of, all of these people make up the body of what we'll call the police. We're, we're still talking about the body of Christ, we're going to get to that in just a moment, but they make up the body of the police force. That no man and no woman that's on the police force can do all that stuff alone. None of them can do it by themselves. Not even Mr. Robocop. All right. He still needs someone to fix him, right? He still needs someone to call. He still needs somebody to come and pick him up. He still needs someone to put gas in the vehicle. You cannot do it by yourself. You cannot be a one-man police force. You can't do it. You can't call yourself. Just imagine what would happen if you were a one-man police force. You know, when people call 911, they get your cell phone. 
911, how can I help you? And who got a domestic violence call? Yeah, I responded to it. I'll be over there in just a moment. And on the way there, what's gonna happen? You get another call, 911. Yes, uh, uh, how can I help you? Yeah, we've got a, uh, a shooting over on 3rd and 5th. Well, I'm responding to something else. Can't do it. Cannot do it. You cannot be one person and do everything. That's not even happening here today. As you sit here, there are a lot of people that went into making today. A lot of people. Some of those people I don't even get a chance to see. The fact that you're in comfortable chairs, the fact that everything is, is clean, the fact that the electricity is on, the fact that there's running water and the bathrooms are there, there's toilet paper inside of the bathroom. Now toilet paper in the bathroom doesn't mean anything to you until you need it. <laughs> when you need your bag, it's going to mean something to you. There's a lot of people, people who are running cameras, people who are running lights, people who put together these presentations, folks that are running the sound right now. There's a lot of people that have to be able to, people who go and get donuts and get juices, that you got to have something tasty when you come inside here. There's a lot of things that go on, and not one person can do it. So now let me talk about what that means as far as the body of Christ. Well, if you think about it, the, the, the same thing happens in the body of Christ. You know, what I wanted to do today is I actually wanted to bring a skeleton in to show you guys, but unfortunately the skeleton got all crazy. I'll do some anything, but the skeleton got broken, so I couldn't bring a skeleton in. The kids in the school broke it, but that's okay. That's all right. We're going to work through it. But if you think about it, the body of Christ is the same way. Now, it says that we have many gifts. We have many gifts, but it's all one body. I want you to think about a physical body. If you think about a physical body, you have arms. Clap your arms just for a moment if you can. That's, a, that's an amazing thing. I, you know, I, um, uh, I didn't realize it, but I, was, uh, I didn't realize how much we are to have arms. I, I seen a guy the other day, um, as I was traveling, that didn't have any arms. So just being able to have arms and being able to clap is a wonderful thing. So it, it, just the arms themselves. If you think about the body of Christ and the physical body, some of you guys are the arms of Christ. And you are the people who are able to, to put your hands around and to love. I think this church actually serves as some of the arms of Christ. And that we're able to put our hands around people and embrace them and love them. You know, when people come and they, they shake your hand and they put, put an arm around you, you feel good, don't you? You feel like somebody loves you, somebody cares. And the same thing is, is there for the body of Christ. There are people who are, are just there for that embrace. There are people that I say are, are, are barely saved. And I like to have these people around me. Just, they just barely saved. They're not saved all the way. They're real rough and tough. They might shoot you. They might cut off a ear. I like to keep those people around just in case it gets rough. And I like to keep real close to them. If you get rough, I know they can handle it. But those people, if you can think about it, sometimes they serve as the ribs. See, what the ribs do is they protect the heart of a thing. They, they are protection. And some of the people in the body of Christ serve as that protection. They're there to protect the gospel. They're here. They're there to take care of things. Some of you guys are, are that kind of person. That's what you've been sent there. And maybe you don't have that loving, dummy spirit. That's okay because, you know, you might have to do something that the average person won't do. Remember when we talk about cops, there are people who run to the gunfight. You can't be like this all loving, dummy person and you're going to run to the gunfight. Right. Right? Because you may have to take out your gun. You may have to take the enemy out. So it takes a very special type of person. And so we need those people in the body of Christ. Some people are, are protection. You know, and they're, 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 they have a very hard exterior. And that's okay. It's there to protect. You have the feet and the legs of Christ. I call those the evangelists. Those people who are not familiar with what an evangelist is, those are the people, now the, the, for the church folks, those are the people who go out and preach the gospel all over the world. But I'm going to take that another step. See, the evangelist not only is the one that's preaching all over the world, but a lot of you guys, the evangelists, just sharing Christ with your neighbor. And sometimes just living Christ. See, because you're able to take Christ to the next level. You're able to walk next door and serve some sugar when they didn't have sugar. You're able to walk across the street and just pray with the family that lost a loved one. You're able to carry, physically carry, 
that message of Christ somewhere else. And see, those evangelists, they can't wait to run with the message. They can't wait to. There's a, a young man that goes to the church, and he is the true legend of Christ. I'm telling you, wherever you put him at, he cannot wait. When I said we need some Bibles, he ran to go pick up some Bibles and just get them from everywhere. When it's time for us to go in the community and just minister to the community, he can't wait to get out there and be able to minister to the community. Now, we need those kinds of people. We need them. But we don't just need those kinds of people. We need all kinds of people. Believe it or not, every single person is extremely important. If you think about something that we, we don't really think about at all, our, our toenails. You don't think about your toenails at all. You know, they're just there. But let me tell you something. Have you ever stubbed your toe? Stubbed a little bitty toe on something that hurt real bad and it messed up the toenail and you can't? It will hurt beyond belief. And so even the little bitty small things in Christ, the things that we don't look at as being big, the people that we think just sit in the back and don't do anything, very important. Because when those people hurt, the whole body hurts. You know, there, was a, there was a gentleman one time, we were, um, we were at a church in, in, in Tulsa at a convention, and there was a youth pastor there. And he was talking about... Um, doing ministry in a major way, and I'm telling you, at this point, this youth ministry was huge. It had literally 3,500 kids on a Wednesday night. Huge. And they were talking about how they got started, and, 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 and this guy, uh, he was a young youth pastor, and this other gentleman came to him, and he said, you know, son, I, I'm, I'm an older gentleman. I'm 78 years old. I think he was. And he said, I don't know what I can do, but I have a heart to reach teenagers. And so, you know, the young youth pastor is looking at him like, dude, I mean, everything's young and hip. I don't know how you're going to be able to, to really reach them, but, you know, i tell you what. How, how, about, how about you prepare to serve? You get, the, uh, you get the chairs and stuff ready to prepare to serve. And he said he walked in on this gentleman one day that was setting up the service, this older gentleman. And he said it was amazing because every single seat he was set and it took him forever, not only because he's 78, but because of what he was doing. And he set the chairs up, and he would measure the chairs to make sure all the chairs were equally set apart. Very, very anal about that, right? And he said he would pause over every chair. And he talked to him later and found out that not only was he trying to make sure that every chair was set up, he was praying over every single chair that the person that sits here will be able to be changed. Their life will be changed. That they'll be blessed over them. That the person that sits here, the gift will be manifest. That the person that sits here will be blessed beyond belief. The person that sits here, no matter what kind of life they've had in the past, that, that, that God will show himself strong in this individual. Every chance. Every one of them. Now here's a God that, that nobody, nobody saw. Nobody saw at all. But yet affected that service. They, they, they said after he got involved, now understand, he was never in the youth service. After he got involved, they said how the youth ministry grew. How it grew, it grew, it grew. So he would have to show up early and early to put out more chairs. You know, I, I remember at the, my own church that I came from, um, a lot of people didn't realize, but the water <laughs> in the baptism was extremely cold. I mean, extremely ice cold. And so I would teach the other pastors, put the game face on. You know, no one can know if it's cold. Just get in there early so your legs can get real numb, and that way you won't look like it's that cold. You know, we would literally have to have to shield people as they walk in, not because we're being all religious, is that we're trying to hide the audience from the shock that's going to happen on the person's face as soon as they hit this cold wall. Okay? There was a gentleman that nobody saw. That when he came to the church, he said, I know this church. I used to go to this church. I built a lot of stuff with this church. A very old church. He said, I built a lot of stuff around this church. He said, I remember that baptism. He, he said, in the baptism, he said, there's a heater that's there. And the heater must be messed up. Now, this is behind the scenes. Nobody knew this was during the week. He said, I can fix that heater. I know it. I fixed it many times before, not a problem. And he went out, got all the stuff on his own, came back, fixed the heat. Nobody seen it. Fixed the heat. 
When we stepped down into that baptism spirit on that day, when we had to baptize the people in ice cold water for three or four years, when we stepped down for the first time and it was nice and toasty and warm, you know we almost shouted right there. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Something happened in that service. When I tell you that, God moved in that service. Now, we baptized people in the very beginning of the service. And it was only about three or four people that we baptized. But something happened different. People got saved. Folk was jumping off of stuff. People of power. I tell you, God moved in that place. The word came down like never before. People's lives were changed. And I'm here to tell you, one of the reasons that people's lives were changed today is because somebody said, you know what, I'm going to be a pinky toe. Come in and fix something that no one else can even see. Amen. See, because he fixed that. Now, no longer were we trying to say, how quickly can we baptize this person? Because we don't want them to get hypothermic. <laughs> we were saying, how do we usher in the Holy Ghost? How do we really bless this person, right? And it changed the entire service. Amen. But nobody seen that. Nobody knew who we were. You know, there's a story in the Bible where there was a guy who was trying to get to Christ, and you had two other guys who were trying to get him there. And, and, and he couldn't walk or anything. He was on a bed. So these two guys were trying to get to the house where Jesus was. And, of course, if Jesus is in the house, you know, it's packed. It's packed. So they couldn't get in the house. So they got up on the roof, tore a hole in the roof, and lowered the guy down so he could get the help that he needed. But we don't know what the names of those guys were. They were serving as pinky toes. There was a gentleman one time that they preached a revival for a full week and he was a little discouraged because sometimes preachers, when they preach a revival, they don't think that that's when you just preach the entire week, maybe in somebody else's church, and people are coming every single day and you're inviting people who are not saved. And so the people uh, uh, who are preaching feel like they haven't done anything if no one comes up and gives their life to Christ. And so day after day, Monday came and no one gave their life to Christ. Tuesday came and Thursday came and, 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 and no one had given their life to Christ. So the preachers feel like, man, I, I'm not doing anything. Friday came. You know, he's not pleading, you know, come to Christ, come to Christ, come to Christ. It was like 15 people got up and came to Christ. One little boy got up and came to Christ. One, that's it. I think he's about to die. One. Now, for a preacher, you might feel like, man, you know, it's one guy. But remember, we're talking about the body of Christ, and each individual thing is important. The name of that one little guy was Billy Graham. Turn the whole world upside down. As a body, we have to learn that when, when that there is no part that's not important. I see people get cast out of churches all the time. You can't look at your left hand and say, I just don't need you today. Amen. They need it. Try to clap without a hand. You look all that hand. <laughs> Try to walk without toes. We even need those people in the body of Christ that we don't like to stink all the time. Because all of y'all got a part of you that stink all the time, but you show me it. We can't cast people out. We need every single person in the body of Christ. Amen. 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 Even those people with the rough exterior, there's still a, a, a place for them in the body of Christ. We gotta remember that. If we turn in the Bible to 1 Corinthians 12 and 12, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of that one body being many are also one body, so also is Christ. It can be a lot of, we're, we're a lot of members. We all have different gifts. Some people can sing. Some people can do administration very, very well. Some people can just run fast. Others have um, the gift of gab. Have, we all have different gifts. And we're going to actually deal with these gifts later on in the year. But all of those things are needed. We all make up one body. And I'm not talking about one church. I'm talking about one body. We're all part of of the body of Christ across the world. That's why we sit in Bible all across the world. Because we're all part of the same body. Your brain doesn't and your heart doesn't only pump blood to your left knee. It pumps blood to the whole body. 
your brain, if it's working properly and as your muscles are functioning properly, it, it sends messages to all of your all of the pieces of your body to teach you how to walk and how to move your fingers and to move your head. It doesn't discriminate. Even if someone else's hand is prettier than your hand, your, your, your brain doesn't discriminate. We have to be the same way in the body of Christ. We have to. The, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 11, because you gotta think about why why are we even here? Why does the, the body of Christ even exist? What, what is our part in it? What are we supposed to be doing? Ephesians 4 and 11 says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets, those are people who are, who are able to just speak into your life and tell you what is to come. And some evangelists, we talked about evangelists, those are people who go all over the place preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some pastors, pastors are those people who lead churches and that pray for those people and they show up to, uh, to the hospital and they, they're, they're giving those people the stationary. They have one place that they stay at. They have a church and they stay there and they preach the gospel there and they see about those people, and then it's their teachers, and those people are, are some, sometimes we have pastors who are teachers as well. It's like myself, I'm a, I'm a pastor and a teacher. I would rather teach you than hoop and holler for the next 30 minutes, because I believe that teaching will solve something. Teaching will change your life. But you have some teachers that are not pastors, and it says in, in verse 12, this is, why, this is why he gave those people. This is the reason why. It says, for the perfecting of the saints. And, and I'm going to, to, to I, won't, I won't break this all the way down, but the Bible, when it says perfect, and we should be perfect, it's talking about mature. So the maturing of the saints, if you can think about how we started this series, is getting you information into you to help you be a mature Christian. That is the whole purpose. And you'll find that the rest of these series are, are doing the same thing. It's helping you to be mature. It's, it's perfecting you. And for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we come, uh, uh, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Once again, that word perfect means the poor. Uh, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children. And it's talking about children and saying that we shouldn't be little babies. This is the thing, you know, uh, how many of y'all are grandparents in here? Y'all are grandparents? Now, now, here's the thing that we don't understand with grandparents, because our kids get away with y'all, get away with stuff with y'all, and we never could get away with it. And they ain't fair. They go through, they knock stuff over, you would kill us. You would kill us right now if we go and knock something over like that. But for the grandbabies, no, it's okay. It, it's all right. He, he's just being a kid. But you let them get away with stuff because they're still children. Now when they get up, they get grown people, and they start knocking over stuff, they put them out of their house, amen? So this is saying that you no longer be a child. This is the reason that he, he gave us these people, to be able to teach us this information so we won't be children, and toss to and fro, and carry them out with every wind and doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie away and deceive. You know those people that are on TV, and they say, you know, bring a thousand dollars for a thousand blessings, y'all seen that? You know, get this, get my water. You know, it, it, we pray over it. It, it guarantees 13 blessings in a bottle. In a bottle. You know, you won't be tossed from to and fro whenever you have that information. And, and, and if you think about it, what we're doing here is if you think about a tree. I used to have a tree um, in, in my front yard that we had to plant. The, the city said you had to have at least two trees in the front and all this stuff. We planted these trees, but they were not large enough to be able to support themselves. We had to really nourish that tree. We had to water it, and I was really proud of those trees. I mean, you know, one day um, I seen a kid over there trying to do something to it, and I almost killed that kid. I'm like, get away from my tree. You know, I watered that tree. You know, we got little stints up on the tree, and the tree been held up. Well, if a good storm came by, y'all know that tree would no longer be in existence, right? It's just a, a, a good breeze came by. Matter of fact, that house, um, I didn't think about it just now, that house that we built um, in Lancaster, and we moved from that years ago, but I actually went back and looked at that house just to make sure, I don't know, I was just testing it, make sure it was still standing after the, after the tornado came through. That, the house actually had some tornado damage, but those trees were still standing. 
See, because the trees weren't little anymore. See, after a while, once you get fed properly, once you get taken care of, once you get the right knowledge in you, you're no longer a children, no longer a child, no longer a small tree. You become like a mighty oak. I've seen a car come around and flip a couple of times. It hit a tree, and the tree didn't even have a leaf off because of how solid it was. And that's our job, is to be able to get information to you so that you're just as solid. In, in verse 15, it says, speaking the truth in what? Love. May grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and accompanied by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. In other words, we all have different gifts, we all have different talents, we all fit together. We all fit together. It, it, I'm a musician by trade, and, and I'll close with this. If you can think about um, whenever you go to a concert, they're all playing together, and it sounds great. I can have a drum sound to start playing, and I want to sound great for a minute, but after a while, we get tired of just hearing the drum play by itself. I can have a piano playing, you know, that's real good. You know, a piano playing right now, that's kind of sound real nice. But it's really only so long you can, you can listen to that. I can have a bass player coming by itself, and you know, if he's taking the solo, it's all great, it's all phenomenal, fantastic, but even him by himself can only entertain you for so long. I would like to think that, you know, I'm one of the greatest saxophone players in the world. That's what we're for, man. Amen. I wish I was, but I, I would like to think that, that, that when I play, you know, it, it really is a, it's a wonderful thing, but you know what? That's the same thing. If I didn't have anything else playing with me and I just started playing, it wouldn't be all that great for very long. But when you put them all together, you got singers, you got a bass player, you have a drum doing these things. You have a keyboard over there, sometimes two keyboard players don't even play. Maybe you got some strings in the back, some background singers. Maybe even have somebody on some bottles and percussion on a combo. When you put all those things together, it sounds great. It sounds better than any of us could have done by ourselves. That's who we are in the body of Christ. You might be a great person, you might be phenomenal, you might be fantastic, and that, that's all fine and dandy, but until we all get together as the body of Christ and be fitly joined together, we can never just reach what we're supposed to reach. So in closing, I want you to think about what part do you play in the body of Christ? I want you to start with you. What, what part do I play? What am I supposed to be doing? Am I the ribs? Am I the fist? Am I the open hand? Am I the arms? I just want to love on people. Am I the legs? Do I need to carry the gospel somewhere? Go ahead. I want you to play that part. Because no matter what you are, you still have, whether you're functioning in it or not. Unfortunately, just this past week, just paralyzed in his right arm from an injury. So he had to shake with his left hand, and his arm is still there. It's just not functioning. And when you're not functioning, it hurts the whole body, not just you. The body is you. Without you, if, 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 if you're the foot and the leg, it's kind of hard for us to run with the gospel if we're missing a foot. It's hard for us to hug with one arm. If you're the protection, how can we be protected? And maybe the, the, the body of Christ is being destroyed because the protection is not there. Figure out what part you play. And play it. Amen? Amen. That's my time. Did y'all learn something today? Yes. Yeah. 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 Next week, you know, we've got some things going on really, really cool the next two weeks. I want you to think about this. Next week, and I 
they usually don't say this, but next week and, and, the, and the few weeks after that, next week specifically, I want you to actually invite people who do go to church. I really do. And let me tell you why. Because next week, we're talking about communion. Now, for those of y'all that have never heard that word communion, that's okay. We're going to go through it next week. But I found out that a lot of people are been taking communion in their churches, and they have no idea what it is, where it came from, why do we do it, or anything. So I really want to have this place full for what? I usually want those people who don't go to church. We have people here that haven't been to church in 10 years, amen, but they're here, and they're still coming. I'll give those people a hand clap real quick. Yeah. That's the rest of the people I like right there, because, you know, the, the church just messed them up. <laughs> man. But next week, because we're doing that teaching, I want you to, to invite some people that actually do go to church. Next Sunday is the first Sunday, so a lot of times people take communion in their churches the first Sunday. We just want to make sure, remember, we're the, we're the whole body of Christ, so I'm not really concerned with membership. Matter of fact, we don't even take membership here. We don't care about that. You show up, you go. Amen? We're going to pray for everybody. You need some help, you give us a call. I don't care if you sit next to you or not. We're going to come help you. Amen? So I want you to invite some people who may already have a church and they're kind of familiar with communion because they're going to take it next week. They can come by here before they go to their church and they can learn what communion is really about. That way they can know because if they don't know, they're missing out on what the, the blessing.